so nice to see uh, late and free. Uh, it's a cold day, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how cold it is. It's a great day for him and, and, and for us. I mean, we're so happy to see him free. It doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't get any better than this. You know, I mean, Leighton uh, is, is such a vulnerable member of our society. Uh, it, you know, he's, he's a member of a visible minority. He's, uh, uh, he's uh, mentally, uh, you know, not a thousand percent. Uh, uh, and and uh, he's an easy victim for a, for a justice system. And, and that's what he was for a long time. When you became aware that there could be forensic testing on these hair samples to determine where this hair came from, um, how exciting was that for you? Well, I'd always known it. I, 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 when I first came to the case, I saw that there'd never been any forensic testing done. So I went to the director of the Center of Forensic Sciences, uh, Mr. Tesserolo, and uh, he was unbelievably supportive and uh, agreed to do it. Uh, they did a proficiency test for us to show that they could do it. Uh, and uh, um, Unfortunately, the Crown opposed us getting the exhibits sent to the Centre of Forensic Science, which meant we took a lot of time to get them there. We had to go to a Supreme Court of Canada and get an order uh, uh, to have them sent to the Centre. And we got that order in November 2010, and within three or four months, we had the results that we knew we'd get. It was just, uh, you know, we had to get them. We were always uh, very uncomfortable with it. Uh, it just seemed to, to me and seemed to me then and that if if you want justice then you should leave no stone unturned and there had been a serious stone that had not been turned over uh, until this point in time and it had to be done and uh, thank God it was done because the Supreme Court of Canada ordered it to be done. Did you, what was his reaction when he learned that this was happening and he was going to walk out of here a free man? Talk to us about how Leighton Hay was feeling. It's hard to tell sometimes how Leighton's feeling. He smiled which he doesn't do a lot of, uh, which isn't surprising necessarily, uh, besides uh, uh, his uh, uh, mental health. Uh, he's had a pretty miserable 12 and a half years. Uh, he's been in places that you or I have never seen the inside of and would never want to see the inside of. And he's lived in them for years and years and years. And uh, uh, he's damaged. Uh, he's not the man he was that I'm told he was by his lawyer who did his trial and the man he saw in 2002 when he was arrested. He's deteriorated a lot. Uh, and uh, now our job is to get him back. Um, Whitby, uh, uh, the, the Ontario Shores in Whitby has done a great job in the last uh, uh, year that he's been there trying to bring back his health. Uh, he's clearly better now uh, than he was a year ago, but uh, there's a long way to go. What, what about, about compensation? If anyone's ever deserved compensation, it's Leighton Hay. Oh my God, does he deserve compensation? Uh, I mean, I, it, it, you can never compensate him for what he's been through, but he sorely needs it and deserves it. And uh, we're going to do our damnedest to get it for him. How do you feel about the apology? You asked the judge for an apology. Why was that important? You don't get that. Uh, I, I, no, you don't. You don't get it very often. Uh, the, uh, I, I think it was important for Leighton. Uh, and I think in a way it was important for all of us to know that this man was done wrong. He was done terrible wrong uh, for more than 12 years. Uh, Phil, what do you think about that? I'm very gratified that Justice McMahon provided the apology. It, it has to mean something. There's only so much you can do, but that's one thing you can do. And uh, he gave it a lot of thought, obviously. He recessed court to reflect on it, and he came back and did it. Um, it's, it's a thing that will echo through the history of this case, I hope. You know, we come to the climax of 12 years of a man's life and there is a strong sentiment on all our parts that the occasion should be marked, that something should be said to recognize what he's been through, that the mere signature on an indictment withdrawing it is not enough for this kind of occasion. And, uh, and the judge agreed and uh, we're grateful. How does this happen? Is it tunnel vision? <coughs> what, what, what's happening to make this happen? You know, in this case, I think that there was a kind of rush to judgment on weak evidence, a bunch of inferences made, and then a narrative built around them that actually lacked proof. So those hairs were crucial to the Crown case, but they were kind of 
meaningless looked at objectively and reasonably, and yet they were built into this story of concealment and of a man with a haircut that Leighton Hay just never had. And so truth got distorted. It's another case of uh, how uh, eyewitness identification, uh, mistaken eyewitness identification, can lead to miscarriages of justice. Is it ever? Uh, there's been a lot of those in Canada and other jurisdictions. and and. Uh, I just wish uh, the courts would better recognize the dangers that exist in eyewitness identification. If it had been properly realized in this case, I don't think the prosecution would ever have commenced. Can you also talk about forensic science and how it is sort of the role it's playing in wrongful convictions? <laughs> well, forensic science can come in either side. It's been the cause of some and the savior in others. And in this one, it was a savior. Uh, and uh, the Center of Forensic Science. I mean, we work with them quite a lot on our cases. Uh, uh, they've always welcomed uh, our, uh, uh, our requests of them. And uh, this case uh, is, as, is as good a case as they've worked on for us as, as we've had. Do you see a difference between this case and other cases where, uh, for example, in the Charles Smith story, you yeah. had a forensic guy who wasn't, who, who didn't have the background to do what he did, but he had forensic backing up to a certain point that locked everything into place. Whereas in this case, it was a crown that was actually like running pump shot over everything. It was a crown that was saying, no, we're not going to go and test this. Is there a difference with this case? It seems to me there is. That's why I'm asking. I, I don't know. I mean, there are cases where uh, the Crown bears some responsibility. I, I, I want to hasten to add it wasn't the Crowns that we had there today, uh, but, but Crowns in the past. Uh, I think the the suggestion in the first place that these hairs or the assumption that these hairs came from a haircut was an assumption made because of an automatic assumption of guilt. Uh, uh, and, and it's that assumption of guilt that, that led to, uh, to, to him being prosecuted and convicted. The, uh, the jury bought it, so to speak. And uh, what a shame that they did, you know, but hard to blame them. They got sort of, you know, led to where they went and, and they shouldn't have been. But uh, uh, I guess today, as much as we can, is a day to celebrate, but it's also, you know, we'll be doing the post-mortems on, on, on how this all went wrong, uh, and, you know, as, as time goes on. Should there be mechanisms in place to hold the Crown accountable to that sort of uh, mishap? Such a few words, though. Well, I think there's a, there's a difference, but certainly if, if the Crown's engaged in actual wrongdoing, which we're not suggesting in this case, uh, but... Uh, you know, in our professions, I guess we all make mistakes. It's more a case of we need perhaps better checks and balances.